Dear Parliamentary State Secretary Norbert Bartler, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, a very warm welcome on behalf of the German Commission for UNESCO to today's online debate on fair trade, a key to sustainable development. We are very pleased to organize this third Resili Art online debate in Germany in cooperation with the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and together with the UNESCO Chair on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions at University Laval in Canada. Thank you, Mrs. Karcher and Professor Guifremont, for our fruitful cooperation on this important and timely topic, Fair Culture. I'm especially glad to welcome you all to this meeting today, one month after the 15th anniversary of the UNESCO Convention for the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. The 2005 Conventions has positively influenced and shaped cultural policy globally. One of the main objectives of this convention is to achieve a much more balanced flow and exchange of cultural goods and services, especially between the Global North and the Global South. This goal stands for supporting artists, cultural professionals, cultural goods and services from developing countries at all stages of the cultural and creative value chain. Fostering fair and sustainable trade and exchange remains a key challenge for the cultural and creative sector. This has become even more pressing this year. We see challenges for the arts and culture resulting from measures taken to curb the COVID-19 pandemic. The German Commission for UNESCO as a national contact point for the 2005 convention has been working on options for fair culture already since 2017. We are very happy to develop this initiative further through an explorative study on fair trade, a key to sustainable development to be published in June 2021. and in the collaboration with the experienced researcher and UNESCO chairholder Professor Guy Fromont and her international team. Thank you, thank you again for this great opportunity and fruitful cooperation. Today's discussion will be focused on fair culture as part of the global movement Resilia Art, an initiative launched by UNESCO since April 2020. It aims to develop perspectives and action on how to strengthen the cultural ecosystem during and after the COVID-19 crisis. The expert panel today on fair culture brings together international policymakers, researchers, entrepreneurs and civil society organizations. It aims to envision a concept of fair culture and sustainable supply chains in and for the culture sector. A warm welcome and special thanks to our panelists. I wish us all a fruitful and productive discussion. Sehr geehrte Frau Professor Böhmer, liebe Maria, sehr geehrte Panelisten, sehr geehrte Gäste dieser Debatte zu Fair Trade in Culture. Kultur und Kreativität sind überall auf der Welt zentrale Motoren der Gesellschaft. Sie sind wertvolle Ressourcen für Wachstum und Veränderung, für nachhaltige Entwicklung, für Chancen und Innovationen. Heute arbeiten wir weltweit mit so vielen Menschen in der Kreativwirtschaft zusammen wie in der Automobil- oder Chemieindustrie. Auch in vielen Teilen Afrikas und Nahost boomt die Kreativwirtschaft von Musik und Mode über Film und Design. So hat Nigerias Filmbranche Nollywood eine fast genauso hohe Wirtschaftskraft wie die Landwirtschaft und setzt pro Jahr eine Milliarde US-Dollar um mit hunderten neuer Jobs. Kultur ist ein Wirtschaftsfaktor 
Oder anders gesagt, ohne Kultur keine Entwicklung. Deswegen fördert die deutsche Entwicklungszusammenarbeit diese Zukunftsbranche. Wir setzen uns ein für bessere Ausbildungsmöglichkeiten, für Jobs und Einkommen, gerade für junge Menschen und auch für Fair-Trade-Standards im Kreativsektor. Das heißt, faire Arbeitsbedingungen, existenzsichernde Löhne, angemessene Gewinnbeteiligung und ökologische Nachhaltigkeit. Es stellen sich konkret folgende Fragen. Wie kann die Sängerin im Senegal bei der Vermarktung ihrer Musik gerecht entlohnt werden? Wie können wir dazu beitragen, dass faire Produktionsbedingungen im Filmsektor geschaffen werden, sodass der Regisseur aus Kenia finanziell davon profitiert, wenn sein Film über Netflix in 180 Ländern gestreamt wird? Wie können junge afrikanische Kreative erfolgreiche Geschäftsmodelle entwickeln, und ihre guten Ideen urheberrechtlich schützen. Bundesentwicklungsminister Müller hat im letzten Jahr das erste staatliche Textilsiegel Grüner Knopf eingeführt. Damit können Verbraucherinnen und Verbraucher auf einen Blick nachhaltig hergestellte Textilien erkennen. Der Grüne Knopf zeichnet Textilien wie Kleidung, Bettwäsche oder Rucksäcke aus, bei deren Herstellung rund 30 Sozial- und Umweltstandards eingehalten werden. Unter anderem die Zahlung von Mindestlöhnen, die Einhaltung von Arbeitszeiten und das Verbot von Zwangsarbeit. Die Kunden wissen dann, wo ein grüner Knopf dran ist, da steckt viel Verantwortung drin. Auch für Güter und Dienstleistungen der Kreativwirtschaft braucht es solche innovative Ansätze. Denn fairer Handel ist ein Schlüssel für Entwicklung. Einen ersten Schritt in diese Richtung machen wir durch die Kooperation mit der deutschen UNESCO-Kommission. Gemeinsam erstellen wir im Rahmen der deutschen EU-Ratspräsidentschaft die Studie Fair Culture als Beitrag zu nachhaltiger Entwicklung. Die Studie soll konkrete Schritte und Ansätze identifizieren mit denen wir zu fairen Lieferketten im Kultursektor beitragen können. Meine Damen und Herren, das ist echte Pionierarbeit. Denn zum ersten Mal bringen wir auf diese Weise Expertinnen und Experten aus Kreativwirtschaft, Fair Trade und Entwicklungszusammenarbeit zusammen, um gemeinsam konkrete Lösungen zu erarbeiten. Unseren Austausch heute, Ihre Anmerkungen und Ihre Expertise möchten wir dabei gern aufgreifen. Daher lade ich Sie herzlich ein, uns heute Ihre Meinung zu sagen. Die Corona-Krise hat verheerende wirtschaftliche Auswirkungen für die Kreativbranche, und zwar überall auf der Welt. Sie wirkt wie ein Brennglas für Ungleichheiten und zeigt, wir brauchen einen fairen und nachhaltigen Handel heute mehr denn je und vor allem in der Kreativwirtschaft. Fair Trade in Culture, der Entwicklungsperspektiven schafft und krisenfest macht. Und darum soll es heute gehen. Ich freue mich daher ganz besonders über Ihre Teilnahme und ich freue mich auf Ihre Beiträge und wünsche uns einen produktiven Austausch. Danke. Well, as we just heard, innovative ideas and pioneering work is needed uh, to overcome global inequalities. I do understand that my loudspeaker system is not working well, uh, so probably you did not uh, get uh, all the introduction um, speakers. I will uh, switch off the system and return. But uh, without further ado, the Secretary of State's message was the perfect introduction to welcome Professor Veronique Gavrimont, holder of the UNESCO Chair on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions at the University of Laval, Canada. Professor Gavrimont will be presenting some key issues of the study, Fair Culture, a Key to Sustainable Development, which is currently being prepared. 
in the welcome introduction, I had shared that uh, for these 60 minutes of fair culture, we are a community of 200 very knowledgeable people from virtually all continents who have registered. So please do use the chat function widely because all this will be included also in the work to come, even if understandably we can't take every <laughs> voice of uh, these uh, 200 wonderful um, colleagues. So please, dear uh, Veronique, the floor is yours for your short keynote. Thank you, Christine, and uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank all the panelists for their interest in our study. As the uh, holder of the UNESCO Chair on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, I'm honored to be associated uh, with the German Commission for UNESCO uh, in carrying out this project, which is a continuation of the work the Chair has produced uh, since its launch in uh, 2016. This debate is an opportunity to talk about a new dynamic that could be injected into cultural cooperation drawing inspiration from a movement that had, had, that had a really positive impact in other areas of international exchanges, the fair trade movement. We strongly believe that this movement offer new tools to stimulate cultural exchanges, not only be, between the global south and the global north, but also between countries from the south while fostering the development of local market. Our task is to study how to carry out this transposition of the fair trade concept, which was conceived and mainly applied in the agricultural and food sectors in the field of culture and creative industries. This mandate involves a systematic and comprehensive reflection on the objectives, the principles, and achievements of the fair trade movement. It also requires engaging in a discussion with both fair trade practitioners and artists and cultural professionals to talk about the transposition and the adaptations um, that will be necessary to take into account the particularities of the value chain in the cultural sector including in the digital environment. But first, what is fair trade? It is defined as a trading partnership based on dialogue, transparency, and respect that seeks a greater equity in international trade. It contributes to a sustainable development by offering better uh, trading conditions to marginalized producers and workers, especially from the South. Among several objectives, fair trade seeks to improve well being of producers, to raise awareness among consumers of some negative effects on producers of international trade, and to improve social justice, sound environmental practices, and economic security. To achieve these objectives, all fair trade actors must be guided by a set of principles, including the payment of a fair price, supplemented by a social premium, reinvest in local development, long-term commitments to ensure financial stability, technical support and training, consumer awareness, respect of labor standards, democratic and transparent organizations, and non-discrimination, including gender equality. When these principles are respected, fair trade provides, provides economic, social, organizational, and environmental benefits. Similar principles are found in legal instruments such as the 1980 recommendation on status of the artist or the 2005 UNESCO convention on the diversity of cultural expressions. And the implementation of these in instruments remains crucial. 
but it is also necessary and urgent to mobilize private actors to a greater extent, including those operating in the digital environment. The private sector has to be involved in multi-stakeholders initiatives that aim at supporting local artists and professionals, as well as, as, well as local consumption and rebalancing cultural exchanges. So, we consider that the concept of, of uh, fair trade conveys values, objectives and principles that are perfectly transposable to the cultural sector, have the potential to mobilize private actors and could provide similar benefits. Our challenge now is to translate this reflection into practice, taking into account the particularities of the cultural value chain. To achieve this, we need to work with two communities. First, the fair trade movement, whose experience is indispensable for us to operationalize the concept of fair trade, of, of fair culture, in order to get the most of it while, care, while, while trying to avoid pitfalls that, uh, that they have already identified. And second, the artists and professional of the cultural sectors who know the needs and the reality of the ground better than anyone else. Together, we must find answers to a whole series of questions that arise in order to bring the fair culture movement to life. For instance, how can a fair price of creative work be determined? And how can the premium be collected and shared with beneficiaries? And who should be the beneficiaries. The fair trade movement is inseparable from education and ad advocacy. How can the cultural sector mobilize the public about fair cultural consumption? And how can the emergence and development of local and regional market be stimulated? Fair trade is also based on local governance and organization of producers into cooperatives or other forms of associations. Is this approach compatible with the specificity of the cultural sector? Finally, the fair trade movement has developed a series of tools, charter, standards, label, certification processes. Is it appropriate to do the same for the cultural sector? or should other avenues be explored? In order to answer these questions, our team has already insist, in, initiated a series of interviews with experts and practitioners, and will continue these over the next weeks. I look forward to hearing your ideas and proposals. And once again, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for uh, the participation in this exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gavrimol. Uh, exactly the question, how this uh, transposition of fair trade principles in the culture and creative sector might work is the issue of the panel debate. I welcome five distinguished colleagues. First, we will be hearing three comments from seasoned experts and practitioners in the cultural field, complemented by two perspectives from the public sector later. And uh, thank you to all who are with us in this 50, 60 minutes for fair culture, continue to share your comments and questions. My colleague are monitoring that closely and this will help a lot for the future. So the first comment, my welcome goes to Dario Soto Abril. He is the global chief executive officer of the Fair Trade International Organization. You bring 30 years of experience in this field, a lot of evidence about efficient ways to tackle poor labor standards and global inequalities in sectors, not uh, just um, food, but also flowers, textiles, 
cocoa and even gold, as I learned from your very impressive monitoring reports. All this is mainly trade in goods. So one interesting question would be, has Fair Trade International ever considered applying these principles also to trade in services? And uh, what role does the digital context play in which we all operate today? Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much and good morning. Thank you for the invitation today. And uh, thank you also for Professor Grimmel for her, her great uh, introduction also about fair trade. I think she explained beautifully what fair trade is. So I don't have to go into that. Uh, and yes, to your question, as fair trade evolves and as uh, it follows many of the principles that the professor explained, uh, you know, fair, fairer trader relationships, uh, we also have a minimum price, a premium. Uh, we, you know, we are also about empowerment of those uh, for whom we work. So the decision for us is key that those who are uh, benefiting from fair trade are actually the ones leading and making the decisions of what to do with the benefits from fair trade. Uh, and we have worked uh, in, in we are doing progress in terms of how do we involve uh, fair trade beyond the uh, uh, goods, uh, the products that you mentioned, cocoa, coffee, banana, many that you might have seen in your supermarkets throughout the world into more of the creative and, uh, and, and uh, creative industries and, and uh, the like. So for example, we, and we are working right now in terms of uh, developing apps for agriculture. And we are making sure that the, the way technology and this creativity in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, using technology for the traceability of the products, but also to convey a different message uh, is, is embed. How does that get in translated into fair trade principles? We're also working with uh, uh, fair trade textiles and cotton. And there's a lot of creativity that we're, and there's a lot of work that we're doing with the, uh, with the uh, big brands, but also with the, persons or the uh, uh, industries that uh, produce the, the textiles and, and, the, and, the, and the clothes that we're uh, wearing in terms of a fair trade. It's, it's a work in progress, to be honest with you, because it's not something that is embedded in their nature. Uh, but we also see a lot of similarities in, in cross-cutting uh, opportunities uh, with, with what fair trade is doing. Uh, we see also the same problems. We see that there's a uh, inequality that there's, uh, as we see also with uh, the agriculture in the agricultural sector, there's no stability in the contracts. There's no certainty about the future uh, and there's no fair, uh, you know, a fair system of pricing embedded in how these uh, products are, are, are purchased for, for lack of a better word. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do more and more with fair trade. And again, we have many experiences with, with, that we're trying to test. Uh, I mentioned already one, some of them uh, data and applications, but also we're testing products even with COVID in terms of um, uh, uh, plays and uh, with uh, radio programs that we're doing, uh, video uh, developments, and many of these creative expressions are not really, as we're seeing it from the, in the global south, at least not being protected, not being covered by any kind of fair trade principle. So that's why uh, when you invited us to participate in this conference, we were super excited and finding like-minded like -minded brains who are also thinking about the same. But yes, this is part of the next strategy that we have in fair trade that goes to 2025. And one of the things that we're really, really putting emphasis is going beyond the agricultural products. And how can we involve also creative industries? How can we involve uh, other, other sorts of, uh, of uh, productivity for the communities? That's excellent. The second comment it comes to us from Nairobi, Kenya. And as already was mentioned, textiles, huh, cotton play a role. Welcome to Mrs. Diba Dosacha. You bring several important perspective to this conversation. You are an award-winning fashion designer, an entrepreneur who employs 30 tailors and embroiderers. You sell handmade garments from natural fabrics to customers from Costa Rica to Canada, from Accra, Beijing to Mumbai and Nairobi. I was really impressed to read that. So of course, facing the global economy uh, as a cultural producer. So uh, my question to you would be, who are your customers in Kenya? 
What do they value about your product and about your approach? Please, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor and privilege to be here. Um, it's a very interesting subject, my clients in Kenya. I started business in Kenya 30 years ago, and I'm very lucky that uh, I've been able to run a business in the global south and have been educated in the global north. So I've had uh, the benefit of both uh, cultures. It's very interesting because when I started my business, it was, um, you know, the local Kenyan did not want to buy local products. It was more lucrative to fly to Dubai, to fly to London, Paris, and in Africa to buy your clothes. And I see the perception over the past 10, 10 years, I'd say, has completely changed. Um, and this is wonderful because now I see my clients are valuing the fact that my company creates employment, values the fact that we are uh, growing uh, uh, an artisanal class. We are uh, you know, doing hand embroidery. We're upskilling women. And this has given a lot of pride to my clients to be able to uh, travel to the global north wearing these garments. And they have equal value to them which is something that I find um, is very, very important for artisans and artists in the global south, is that our products have not been valued as much as uh, in the global north. And uh, all these, now with the change, it's absolutely amazing to see that we, are, um, we have customers who can afford to be buying um, artists in the north, which they do, but they also uh, value our products in the south. Um, so each piece, uh, they, they now understand that each piece is free of art. It is unique. Um, I think uh, people understand more the value they have as a company um, and really, really value. And, uh, you know, seeing that kind of change is, um, you know, just amazing for us. It, it's, uh, it uplifts us and um, gives us the same kind of pride as our uh, colleagues in the world. So, thanks for this, um, also depicting how things are changing, eh? because th this is what we want to explore together, eh? is are there uh, positive elements also for developing the national and local markets, and how can that partnership connect uh, more fruitfully in, in the future. So our third commenter comes from Casablanca, Morocco, uh, Kenza Sefriwi. Uh, she will comment from her experience as an independent publisher on Toute Lettre, uh, of you are publishing nonfiction in the humanities. Uh, exactly one year ago, in October 2019, you uh, discussed at the Frankfurt Book Fair hmm, with other publisher colleagues from the Global South how to make supply chains in the book industry fair and sustainable. There were colleagues like Aku Books Audio from Ghana, the first audiobook producer in Africa, or Editorial Sigilo from Buenos Aires, and uh, 25 more from Mexico to Pakistan. So it probably would be nice to hear what lessons hmm, from this exchange should be shared with us uh, today? Please, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I'm very honored to be part of this discussion. Uh, of course, uh, since uh, last year, which uh, seems to me a very long time ago in another, in another time, uh, for me, the expression fair culture should not be a simple uh, label. Uh, and should be a real process in order to improve what all the values we, we, we were discussing. I would like to focus on the example of the school book, which is not my personal experience, but which may be very significant for us because it's, uh, for example, in, in, in a lot of African countries, the school book is the only uh, field of the book 
that, you, that is a lucrative market. Uh, for example, what I'm doing uh, uh, for uh, nonfiction or um, uh, novels don't mean anything in, the, uh, in, the, in a trade point of view. And uh, it's a very uh, taught question because the, the situations are, uh, are very complex and difficult to know because of uh, uh, first the political dimension and a lot of informal uh, economy. But uh, the main uh, trend uh, in the field of the school book is a practice of uh, predation of southern markets um, by uh, huge international groups, mainly French or Canadian or from Asia. Uh, Asia. And the practice of lobbying uh, on teachers, on booksellers, on distributors uh, by uh, selling directly the books um, to, to schools and just jumping over the, the whole book chain. So as an example, um, unfortunately, I don't have more recent uh, 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 example, but Achète Livre, Inter Achète International, uh, holds um, 80, 85% uh, of the turnover of the school edition in Sub-Saharan uh, uh, Africa in 2010. Um, the role also of uh, founders like uh, uh, La Banque Mondiale and the uh, African Bank of Development and uh, bilateral uh, help in publication of school uh, books are also a kind of, of problems. Another problem, uh, the fact of giving uh, books uh, doesn't help to, uh, uh, cons uh, to, to strengthen the local market. So um, this situation uh, is also the consequence of a certain vision raised, uh, uh, um, carried by the UNESCO itself after the independence of the African countries, because uh, in this time, UNESCO privileged the, the uh, teaching literacy and giving access to book and encouraged importations of books instead of uh, putting in uh, creating local uh, markets so the, we leave actually the consequences uh, of all this history and uh, the, the, there are different of course situations um, uh, in uh, in the different states but the main recommendation would be uh, uh, the, the following ones first the concept of national preference as the cultural exception the um, creating devices uh, to protect bibliodiversity and local uh, creation by um, calls, uh, called offs reserved for uh, national publishers. This is what, for example, Mali and Ivory Coast are, are doing. Uh, to also to divide into lots these calls off in order to help smaller publisher to take part in the uh, in those um, calls transparency of course this is the main uh, issue uh, in those calls um, organization of the whole book chain and its professionalization of course if you don't have a solidarity, a professional solidarity, you can't be a, a, a lobby uh, and discuss with your government in order to improve uh, a, a national policy for, for the book. Um, protection of, of copyrights, yeah. skills transfer, and uh, of course, try to organize um, uh, the money earned in the school books should be uh, uh, benefits also to other kinds of books for uh, general literature, but also booksellers for printers uh, and favorize uh, all the local uh, industry. And of course, uh, favorize um, equ uh, um, equity and reciprocity. In, uh, I would like just to finish to pay uh, a tribute to the uh, International Alliance of Independent Publishers that worked a lot on this issue. And I will share with you in the, um, in the message section, the link to uh, a short guide to, with recommendations to a fair trade in this uh, practical uh, uh, issue. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. This easily showed that uh, ideally we should have a full day just to examine 
uh, indeed uh, the inside uh, view for each uh, sector. And you bring a very encouraging news which shows that uh, important cultural producers already are studying uh, these supply chains very carefully. And of course, school books are like staple food hmm, for, for uh, children uh, around the globe. So it's very interesting to examine also this type of, of markets and very rightly, the issue, the elephant in the room is copyright and intellectual property right. This also was mentioned by colleagues in, in the chat because this is probably the biggest difference in comparison to agricultural products which make uh, cultural products uh, differently. Uh, given the fact that 60 minutes for fair culture are 60 minutes and not uh, 300, um, um, allow me to in continue encourage you, please share your elements uh, through the chat. Uh, while we proceed, we'll have, we have now a very short um, um, video before I will invite the two colleagues from the public sector uh, for their comments. There is a three minutes short uh, video which gives a glimpse on a recent joint initiative from Germany in the uh, culture and creative uh, sectors to give us a bit of moving images. Please, video on. Die Kreativwirtschaft, einer der am schnellsten wachsenden Märkte der Welt. Heute macht er 6% der globalen Wirtschaftsleistung aus. Auch in Afrika boomen kreative Branchen. Film, Mode, Musik, Design. Allein 2017 wuchsen Afrikas Kreativbranchen um 10%. Sie sind Wirtschaftsfaktor und Zukunftsmarkt. Ein Blick nach Nigeria macht das deutlich. Hier hat die Filmindustrie Nollywood einen Umsatz von jährlich einer Milliarde US-Dollar. Investitionen zahlen sich hier aus, denn von Innovationen im Kultursektor profitieren auch klassische Wirtschaftszweige und sie sind eine Investition in die Jugend des Kontinents. Denn ihre kreativen Ideen und Lösungen schaffen Arbeitsplätze. Afrika has a medium age of 18. This makes it the youngest continent in the world. With 60% of Africa's population aged under 25 years, this demographic has the potential to drive the growth of the continent. Deshalb schafft die deutsche Entwicklungszusammenarbeit Jobs und Einkommen für junge Menschen im Zukunftsmarkt Kultur bei fairen Arbeits- und Produktionsbedingungen. Wir setzen auf Afrikas Jugend und zwar durch Stärkung der Bildung ganz besonders der beruflichen Ausbildung und Fortbildung. Die deutsche Entwicklungszusammenarbeit gewinnt neue Kooperationspartner aus der Kulturbranche. So engagiert sie sich zum Beispiel bei der Ausbildung junger afrikanischer FilmemacherInnen mit prominenter Unterstützung. Ich habe Ihnen gesagt, ich will nicht, dass ihr Hollywood-Filme macht. Ich will auch nicht, dass ihr denkt an Festival von Cannes oder Oscars sondern erzählt eure Geschichten in eurer Sprache. Einige der Filme sind von deutlich mehr Menschen gesehen worden als, äh, als alle meine Filme. <lacht> weil, einfach, weil der Kontinent natürlich gierig auch ist nach, nach, äh, nach subjektiver Stimme. Mehr als 1400 Filmschaffende in 20 Ländern wurden fortgebildet. Film ist Arbeitsmarkt, aber auch wichtiger Beitrag zur Meinungsbildung. Genauso wie Musik. Sie ist starker Katalysator und ein interessanter Absatzmarkt für große Musiklabels. Denn mehr als 560 Millionen AfrikanerInnen wollen ihre Musik über das Internet streamen. Deshalb unterstützt die deutsche Entwicklungszusammenarbeit die Kreativwirtschaft in Afrika. very clearly there are many more players uh, from the producing sectors which uh, will be a part of this conversation 
and also the specificities of the production chain in films and music need to be considered, especially also the role of uh, uh, digital platforms. Uh, these, all these um, colleagues will need to join the uh, conversation on uh, prospects for third culture. Uh, now for the two um, uh, comments on the panel here, the question is what is and what can be the role of the public sector uh, to initiate this shift towards a fair culture development perspective? The first comment comes from Giorgio Ficarelli. You have a long and substantial experience with the cultural dimensions of development, having worked in Eastern Africa and the Middle East, among other things as the head of the culture sector of DEFCO at the European Commission. Where do you see the most doable and the most urgent entry points for this fair culture perspective? Both elements are of interest here, doable and uh, urgent. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I hope you will uh, be able to see me. I, I change uh, I change location to see because uh, I, I was witnessing some problem of co of communication uh, or transmission. I hope that now you can see me, you can hear me uh, from here. Um, I I would like to to highlight uh, two things. You see that uh, as it came already quite uh, evident from the. From the uh, from the discussion uh, up to now, uh, the transposition of fair trade principle to the creative sector is not an automatic uh, thing. You know, the, the creative sector has a, a very special uh, characteristics. You know, uh, the, the, the way how the labor forces are employed in the creative sector, particularly in the music or. Uh, uh, art, cinema, and theater. Do you have a very few uh, regular uh, regular workers? A uh, lot of uh, temporary contracts. Um, so it, it is a it is a quite special uh, uh, sector. Then uh, this discussion is very welcome. Actually, I may, actually I would really be interested to know the uh, waiting for the final results of the study with a lot of uh, uh, curiosity. Uh, I would like to highlight two things. Uh, one is the, the issue of salary, of uh, level of salary and the working condition. The other one, the issue of rights, uh, who are fundamental for the for most of the of the creative sector. Mm -hmm. For the first one, um, I think we we had quite a lot of experiment uh, how to apply for uh, fair labor and fair trade. Uh, concept to, to the production of um, production and selling of uh, uh, cultural goods or, or creative uh, products um, in a different uh, area, particularly in Africa, but not only in uh, in Asia or Latin America. Uh, one of the key issue we have developed, for example, with the with the project, and uh, some of you will uh, know already, I'm sure, is called Ethical Fashion Initiative. Uh, we have tried. We have done two two things. Uh, one is the uh, the setting up of a compliance scheme where you have uh, actually as a final and as a final client you can see with your phone when you're buying the the the, 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 the all the story of, of, of the of the product of the of the uh, of the tissue of the uh, wardrobe whatever, uh, but. Um, so you, you, as a consumer, you know the story. Who was the artisan who created, where it was sold, uh, etc. Uh, the other one is try to uh, really invest in quality. We invested in quality, in the sense that we try not to to really address to address the higher part of the market. So the the the, the, the more expensive, uh, we've been able to. To, to sell the product of a, of a reasonable price in order to be able to remunerate in the right way the, the cooperatives and the artisan and the, the, the designer, the local designer. 
of the thing. I think we are, we have been quite successful in this uh, big big mark like uh, Vivian Westwood, uh, Stella McCartney, Fendi. They are uh, playing the game and they are buying our things, uh, and this is allowing us to uh, to make to create a thousand of jobs in different countries. The second, the other part is, is uh, the copyright, uh, the issue of right, uh, droit d'auteur. Uh, I think for sector like music, uh, cinema, theater, but uh, this is fundamental, particularly for music. You have seen uh, uh, more and more there have been a huge development of the market for African music, for example. But uh, and in, during the COVID time, uh, everybody is looking at uh, at the internet, looking for uh, for for music, for cinema, for theater. Uh, this, unfortunately, not uh, very very rarely uh, generates revenue for those who are the creator of, of the contents, and this is the big issue. I think uh, we need absolutely to focus on this. There are legislation. We have we have a program with UNESCO to uh, an expert facility to help the government to, to have a good regulation and the enforcement mechanism. But, uh, you know, with the rapid uh, development of technology and particularly now that uh, with the COVID issue, uh, the main source of uh, revenue, for example, for, for the music industry is live performances uh, because the, the record market has collapsed uh, all over, even for the Western, uh, uh, in the Western world, uh, it is clear then that if there's no mechanism to collect uh, and to transfer the rights from uh, uh, the, the consumer market to the producer one, uh, we have a, a huge problem. Thanks for pointing uh, that out so crystal clear because this is indeed the, the elephant in the room and that the whole uh, system of uh, collective rights needs uh, rethinking in a fair culture perspective, reaching especially to young users and audiences hmm, who have a different uh, approach to the use of services. Also in the chat, one colleague from the International Music Council pointed to studies done on fair trade in music uh, earlier. This is uh, super welcome. Please share any sources which also might help to inform the study the, the Laval research team is doing. We need these inspiring uh, practices and also pointers where in the sectors there is already some thinking how to move forward there. So thank you very much, Giorgio Figarelli. Of course, you, you, European Union is indeed a strategic partner for UNESCO uh, in, in this field. And uh, we uh, also noticed to his interest that DEFCO will be rebaptized from January onwards and will be called the Director General for International Partnerships. So this is good news that you already are moving towards a fair cooperation perspective, uh, even in changing your name. So last uh, but not least, um, this, for the perspective of a national government, uh, dear Mrs. Kercher from Berlin, hmm, the need for public policies had been stressed by some of the colleagues on the panel already. In 2005, when the UNESCO Convention on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions was adopted, you were working at UNESCO. Uh, since 2017, you are leading the division for media, culture, creative industries and sports at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, in Berlin. So uh, please uh, share with us how we already saw, of course, examples in the video, uh, but more specifically, having listened to the points raised here, how do you think a ministry possibly can contribute to strengthening a fair trade, fair culture approach in our current context, which is the 21st century and the digital environment. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina Merkel and colleagues at the German UNESCO Commission. And thank you also to my co-panelists. Um, we are very excited to delve deeper into this um, rather new topic um, and very um, excited about the study that we are working on. Uh, hopefully we will get it out by next summer. 
and also presented um, to everyone. So this is really, as our parliamentary state secretary has already pointed out, this is really what we're doing here. And um, not only bringing together people from, from very different backgrounds, but also um, bringing together creative sector and development cooperation. It's, a, it's rather new for at least for, for German development cooperation. We started about two years ago. And um, the idea really is to, to acknowledge and recognize the economic um, potential of, of the sector and um, to, really, um, to really harvest the sector for, for, for what it actually uh, can offer, which is so much more than, than uh, jobs and employment, which is of course a very important factor, but of course it also contributes to um, cultural diversity and um, of course builds um, a, a diverse image, especially when, when we look to Africa, which is our uh, main partner um, continent, and knowing of course that we talk about very different countries, um, but it really um, helps to, to um, tell the success stories that we need so badly and, and not only crises and, and conflict, but to talk about the huge creative potential that is there uh, with regard also to the, the young population, um, and um, the cross innovation that the sector offers um, into maybe more traditional business sectors. Um, and as we've uh, just seen in the film, which was, uh, I hope you excuse this, um, uh, our, our three minutes of commercials, so to say, <laughs> for what we do. Um, so I won't go into this uh, deeper, but um, it, it basically is supposed to be a, you know, a bold statement for uh, looking at, at um, the, the many aspects of the creative sector and, and uh, the many contributions um, it, can, uh, it holds for, for development. But of course, what we're talking about today, one of and the question you asked and our core question is how can these creative entrepreneurs and artists actually live of what they do? How can they access financing, access markets, access fair competition? And uh, of course, I, I'd like to stress what uh, Giorgio has said um, with regard to copyright. This is an immensely important um, area because uh, in, in the creative industries, we're not only talking about goods or products such, may, such as maybe a film or a song, but we also talk about intellectual property. So of course, the World Intellectual Property Organization uh, may also be a, a very important um, partner uh, in, in the steps ahead. Uh, I'd like to, uh, with, yeah, with, with a view to, to specific next steps, I would like to bring two initiatives to your attention that German Development Corporation is involved in. One is a, a national state-run certification level label of fair textiles, the so-called green button that our state secretary mentioned earlier. And the other one is actually an international effort to provide legal support to emerging economies and developing countries for fair contract negotiations. It's called Connex and it was um, initiated actually by the G, then it was still the G8, I think 2013, um, but it's really grown into a very interesting um, uh, instrument. So the, the green button um, was initiated by um, our Minister for Development Cooperation, Dr. Gerd Müller and it accredits socially and environmentally sustainably sustainable textiles that are sold by responsible companies. So um, as the first, it's actually the first state run certification label. And um, this green button focuses both on the product, like a pair of jeans or a bed sheet and on the company. So all products must fulfill nearly 30 social and environmental minimum standards. And the company as a whole also needs to provide evidence that it practices due diligence according to 20 criteria. And these enterprise related criteria are based on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. That is also to say that some of the instruments or the basis that we need are already out there. And then independent auditors monitor the extent to which the requirements are fulfilled. And this whole process started with a round table of stakeholders, which then turned into a partnership for sus sustainable textiles, which then turned into the green button. And today consists of uh, 30 members. So it's Thank you very much for sharing this uh, highly interesting examples, huh? which certainly will be studied in detail 
um, we are close, we are approaching the end uh, from the chat. Yeah? There were very interesting elements pointing to work done in the parliamentary assembly yeah, of ICP countries and European Parliament. A colleague from International Theatre Institute was asking how this debate relates to the preferential treatment idea in the 2005 convention. This is exactly what it's meant to stimulate because we realized preferential treatment being a very technical trade term is hardly understood, nor by, neither by artists nor by creators. And, and we realized with this fair culture uh, approach, it's uh, uh, enabling a lot of uh, conversations. So as was said by all of our panelists, resilience and sustainability uh, is the way to go. Intellectual property rights need to be resorted in order to make revenue flows um, uh, happen. Um, as that, this is work in progress. Uh, we understood with the Green Bottom Initiative, just outlined by Mrs. Kerger, this was a work of seven years <laughs> to come where you are now. So let's be clear, we are in for a solid marathon together. It's very encouraging because it's also a daunting task <laughs> for the research team at the University of Al. So it's very encouraging to hear all the voices and please stay connected uh, with us. Uh, continue also alerting us to relevant players, uh, to sources. The team at Laval has already identified 250 studies and documents which feed into their work. But please, all this helps to become stronger together. And it's very encouraging to hear also from Fair Trade International that there is strategic thinking hmm, going on on their turf. And it's uh, super uplifting to see in how short a time, yeah, Mrs. Kerche, in only three years that you and your team have been starting to introduce this line of thought into German development cooperation. Many new ways of working together have been become possible and that's the line of thought to end these 60 minutes for fair culture. And please already pencil in your agendas, June 2021, will definitely be a next and much longer conversation. <laughs> Keep 48 hours free for two nights of fair culture debate and give everybody a big hug and a big uh, applause to all our panelists and uh, bear with us the technical uh, elements were not always on our side, but this is the digital life of 2020. Bye bye and stay safe at the best. Bye, thank you.